Yo, what's going on you guys? Catface Kid here. Today I invite you to join me in a new video series in which I will be reviewing an entire year in games and talking about some of the most important events in gaming that happened in each video's respective title year. Now, it wasn't really that hard for me to decide what year I was going to be starting this off with. I just revisited some of my personal favorites from my own library, and honestly, I- so, as a 1996 baby, I really didn't start nerding out on video games until about 5 years old, and this also happened to be the year that my brother and I got a PlayStation 2 for our birthdays, which began an 18 plus year love for the gaming culture and community. So, to jumpstart, I'm gonna back my ass up to the year that truly started it all for me, and review the year in gaming of the year, uh, 2001's year games in... I will be reviewing the year game i will be reviewing 2001's review year. i will be reviewing 2001's year as a whole based on the context of the games released inside of it what ultimately ended up being the first major release of the year is arguably still the most relevant game of the year to debut runescape if you have owned a computer with internet access at any point in the past 20 years, there's a very good chance that you've not only heard of RuneScape, but also have at least made an account at some point. Even if you think that you didn't, there's probably a new Master 420 out there under your name that you made in middle school 15 years ago with level 1 stats across the board, hanging out, abandoned in Lumbridge, wondering when dad is going to come back from the store with his cigarettes. The point is that RuneScape had and has had a massive cultural impact on the gaming community for nearly 20 years and has earned its spot as one of the biggest online games of all time. Next up, and in the ballpark of online gaming, Sega debuted Fantasy Star Online for the Dreamcast. I was only 5 when it came out, and at the time at least, the internet was kind of supposed to be a foreign concept to 5 year olds, so I'm going to be transparent in mentioning that I never actually played Fantasy Star Online. However, it was the first major online RPG released for home consoles, and even after Sega showed the Dreamcast the rabbits, it converted support of the game over to GameCube and Xbox via ports as a result of its initial commercial and critical success. Moving on to our first single player game in Paper Mario, which is a turn-based RPG that acts kind of as a spiritual successor to Super Mario RPG, although stylistically it's pretty different and probably one of the most unique Mario game lines that exists to date. Um, Paper Mario is a charming game with awesome music and a unique art style that follows the basic Mario formula in Peach being kidnapped by Bowser and Mario having to do some zany stuff to eventually rescue her. But it's the fun characters and interesting level design that kind of acts as a beautiful glue that binds the traditional pages together to create an experience that still to this day feels pretty timeless and fresh. Paper Mario 64 is actually my favorite Paper Mario game and I know that not everybody's gonna agree with that, but I'm taking it to the grave. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sticker Star fans. I now want to take the time to highlight another really cool, unique development that was made in the gaming community in 2001. So Capcom took on a pretty big risk in trying to produce three Legend of Zelda games side by side that would act as a conglomerated single story if played all together. Unfortunately, the task was understandably considered too much for Flagship, the subsidiary dev team of Capcom that was creating these games. However, this didn't stop them from mostly seeing the project through with two completed final games instead of the three in Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons. The two games could be played independently and your adventures in both could be tied together through passwords or a game link cable. This allowed for things like trading items or consequences as major as altering the story of one of the games to act as a sequel to the other if you had already completed the first one. This endeavor is incredibly impressive, and if you only had the energy to play one of the two games, they both felt very complete and offered gameplays that could cater to a range of gamers as ages kind of had a focus on puzzles, and seasons existed with more of a focus on action, which are both two things that the Zelda franchise is very well known for. The games were received with critical acclaim and are considered two of the best games to ever see the Game Boy Color. Up next is easily a top 3 2001 game for me in Conker's Bad Fur Day. This game is the black sheep turned golden child of the N64 platforming era. What ultimately ended up being a genre defying, game changing, action adventure, platformer, shooter, and everything in between is still probably considered one of the most iconic gaming experiences of the 2000s and for very good reason. Conker's Bad Fur Day is the adventure of an alcoholic squirrel full of movie references, jokes, and non-stop humor. And 
If my parents weren't savvy to what that pesky little M meant on the front cover of the box, I probably would have experienced it much earlier in life. Unfortunately, I didn't actually play Conker's Bad Fur Day until about high school, but I mean, the game definitely isn't meant for kids, and my experience with it was also much better off because of it. Still, as a kid who grew up on Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64, knowing that the same guys who made this ended up making this made the mature, witty experience all the better. <laughs> At this point, I'm just gushing, but honestly, if you enjoy early gen gaming and haven't given Conquer a shot, just test the waters. It's such a unique and entertaining experience that you'd be doing yourself a disservice by not at least taking a sip of the Conquer lemonade that Rareware's Lemon Tree gave us. Actually, <laughs> on second thought, you probably better not. Alright, so the Game Boy Advance sees its release by Nintendo as the successor to the Game Boy Color, both of which had a pretty big impact on my childhood. I'm a big Pokemon guy, and I sunk hours into Gen 2 and Gen 3 on these bad boys growing up. Over the course of its lifetime, the Game Boy Advance would see fantastic releases such as The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, Tipped and Caper, Metroid Fusion, etc, etc. Overall, not even really remotely the most revolutionary Nintendo handheld, but it was a lot of fun for little me nonetheless. Speaking of Pokemon, the sequel for Stadium came out, and to me, it really took the formula of the first one and knocked it out of the park. These games aren't that advanced, they just take the turn-based formula of regular Pokemon, throw it into a 3D arena, and slap some bonus minigames in to create a fun home console couch co-op version of the Pokemon that young gamers loved. They are simple and sweet with great music, awesome minigames, and a safe yet tried and true formula for Pokemon battling. Alright, moving on to Mario Party 3. Not really a whole lot to say. I mean, Mario Party is historically one of the best party games, and that all started on the N64. In spite of some recent hiccups, the OG Mario parties are consistently a blast with a few friends that you don't mind severing ties with. Personally, I think Mario Party 2 is the best Mario Party game, but 3 is a gem too and a great pickup if you want to have some innocent couch co-op fun or completely destroy any relationships that you have and or find yourself sleeping on the couch for the next three weeks. <laughs> Not speaking from personal experience or anything. Sonic Adventure 2 came out in 2001 as the final Sonic game for the Dreamcast console after it had been discontinued, and honestly, Adventure 2 is a lot of fun. The crossing stories of good and evil felt pretty ahead of their time, at least narratively in the early 2000s, and I have super fond memories of just chilling in the chow garden for hours with my little sister, who is by no means a gamer, and just messing around with the chows to see how the good or evil influences affected their development. I have super fond memories of flying around as Knuckles in that weird Halloween level, and honestly, even though it's kind of a meme, the music in City Escape is iconic as hell. I've noticed this as a running theme for myself actually while reviewing these games, but stuff that would make me cringe, or that I would consider less than perfect nowadays, was so much fun to me as a kid. I miss the innocence of not caring how perfect something was and not realizing the flaws in games as I played them. <laughs> but I mean, we'll get to that one later. <laughs> Yo, I can't believe that they made a whole Final Fantasy game based off of the characters at the beginning world of Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but, I mean honestly, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find someone who doesn't consider Final Fantasy X one of the most iconic Final Fantasies to date. It was the first Final Fantasy in the PS2 era, and the graphical leap from 9 to 10 was pretty notable. In terms of story, it's pretty par for the Final Fantasy chorus in that it's grand and emotional and amazing, and it clearly does have a dedicated fan base for a reason, because I mean, it's been ported to a million consoles since release, and that never happens. Alright, let me paint the picture for you right now. Imagine you're in elementary school in the early 2000s, it's recess, you pull out your Game Boy, you pull out your lunchbox, you got your, your Capri Sun, your, your Go-Gurt, your turkey sandwich with the crust cut off, and you are ready to mob through Johto. It's an, it's an otherworldly feeling. And, you know, this was before I was allowed to freely roam the internet, so when I found out on my own that Kanto was an entirely full region as post-game content, I was ecstatic. It's a kind of magic that just doesn't really exist for me anymore, and I'm sure if you were around my age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
Second gen Pokemon just gave me a sense of adventure and wonder that has been unparalleled for a near 20 years and it's the only game in the franchise that I have consistently gone back to and played multiple times throughout my climb to adulthood. Crystal adding new story elements and the ability to play as a girl to cover representation of the fan base was awesome. Game Freak just really hit this game out of the park and it still holds up for me to this day. I am a huge fan of skateboarding video games and that's in large part due to the original four Tony Hawk Pro Skater entries. For me, 3 improved on everything that was already great about the first two, and it was supported by a great soundtrack alongside wonderfully creative and inspired worlds to traverse. Speaking from experience and severe clumsiness, I can confirm that you really don't need to be a graceful skateboarder in real life to shred in the Tony Hawk games, with Pro Skater 3 being an absolute blast. Alright, it's here, the elephant has arrived, let's just talk about it really quickly and get this over with. I only have incredibly fond memories of The Wrath of Cortex. I played it a bunch as a kid and I loved every second of it. One year for Christmas as a child, I actually got a GameStop gift card and instead of buying something new, I just went online and ordered a second copy of The Wrath of Cortex. I genuinely have no idea why. Kids are stupid and I am no exception to that rule. <laughs> the honest truth is that I didn't even realize people didn't like this game until I started getting back into gaming YouTube in the last few years, and since revisiting it, I totally understand why. I think this more so just speaks to the magic of being a kid because there are games that I loved when I was younger that I still think are masterpieces, foreshadowing 2.0, and there are some that I now recognize as much more flawed than I remember, with this game unfortunately falling into the category of the latter. Halo is another game that I haven't really played much of, but was a necessity for this list. While I was never an Xbox guy growing up, there was always a part of me that kind of wished Halo wasn't an exclusive to the line, and it was really the sole IP tempting me to creep over multiple times. Anytime I slept over at an Xbox owning friend's house, hours were lost to the Halo franchise. At the time, this game kind of felt like it evolved combat gaming, <laughs> see what I did there, and brought a whole new level to couch co-op. This franchise is up there with James Bond on the N64 contesting the most fun that I have had playing shooters locally with my buddies, and as someone who never owned it myself, I have nothing but good memories attached to it. The Halo franchise as a whole is one of the 45 franchises that has sold over 50 million copies, and it's only been around for 19 years. I feel that it has definitely earned its place in gaming history, starting off all the way back in 2001 with Halo Combat Evolved. When I said that RuneScape was arguably the most relevant 2001 game currently, the only other one that came to mind was Super Smash Bros. Melee. This game revolutionized the fighting genre so hard that 19 years later it is still the face of the scene. And just like Halo, this franchise falls into the same group of over 50 million copies sold. While it wasn't the first like Halo Combat Evolved, it only improved on its predecessor in every way and paved the future for the franchise in huge strides. The lineup, the mechanics, the fluidity of the gameplay were all so perfect and polished that the game's competitive scene is still incredibly active, with there being tournaments held globally on a very consistent basis. Whether they're local meetups or professionally organized events, this game has created a competitive culture like no other local co-op. And while I don't want to dwell on it for too long, I feel like it's important for me to comment that there are serious changes and movements happening in the competitive Smash scene right now, and I fully support it. Creating a safe and friendly environment for gamers should be the main priority in the scene, and I am incredibly happy that dangerous and predatory members of the community are being exposed, and I hope that the community only prospers from here on out in the long run. Alright, I'm just going to be upfront about it. Jack and Daxter is one of my favorite games of all time. I am absolutely biased when I say that this game is master class for its time. Early gen 3D platformers like Banjo, Jack and Daxter, and Mario 64 are the highlight of my childhood, and this game easily captures the best part of what I love about all of those games. Most importantly for me though is that the world of this game is just pure magic. All three major hubs offer a sense of wonder and adventure that transcended everything I knew about gaming at the time. The lack of loading screens and the seemingly endless horizons made me feel like for the first time I was fully immersed and existing within the world of a game. The closest thing I can compare it to is like when I played Breath of the Wild for the first time. It was genuinely Breath of the Wild for my 6 year old self. And even if we stopped there, this game would still be an 8 out of 10 for me, but the collectibles, the characters, and the ambiantic music all wrap this game up into being the perfect package. The cherry on top of the eco Sunday is that the mechanics of the game are so good. The basic movement of this game stayed the same throughout the entire series, which just speaks to how timeless it is. Punch, jump, spin will never not feel amazing. 
Seriously, if, if you haven't played it in a while, just go back and run around Sandover Village. The game still feels great. While it's not a hard game to 100%, I find myself coming back and doing exactly that at least once every couple of years, and I can confidently say that it's something I will continue to do consistently until I fall into a giant vat of dark ego, I guess. Because, I mean, I, I think Otzel hands are too small to hold a controller, but I, I could be wrong though. <laughs> Another game that I think soured with some people over time that I adored as a kid is the redheaded stepchild of the Mario universe, Luigi's Mansion. <laughs> it was the first real game that highlighted Luigi as the main protagonist, kind of. But more importantly, it's a game that takes place in a haunted house where you're essentially a Ghostbuster working for Max Mom from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, trying to get back your brother Mario. Yeah, you ever heard of him? It's awesome because one, Luigi is my favorite character from the Mario universe, and two, it's a freaking Mario game where you hunt ghosts in a haunted mansion. <laughs> I have no idea who thought to make this game, but I would like to shake their hand because just like Jack and Daxter, I still find myself going back to it every few years to this day. It hasn't spoiled for me, and I honestly think it's just as great today as I did when I was five. It's short, sweet, and has an insane amount of character. It truly stands out to me as one of the greats of the Mario universe, and I'm so glad that the third installment lived up to the hype all these years later. Okay, we're going to put a cap on this year by briefly discussing one of my favorite consoles of all time. I know I've said favorite a lot in this video, but I wasn't lying when I said that 2001 was a huge year for me in gaming. Coming in only behind the PlayStation 2 and the Nintendo 64, the Nintendo GameCube played one of the largest roles in my childhood. The GameCube dropped at the end of 2001, and despite its mediocre lifetime sales coming in nearly last behind only the Wii U, I feel that it truly captured my perception of the Nintendo magic better than any other console the company has ever put out. Some of my fondest memories include playing through and beating Luigi's Mansion in its entirety while the ball dropped on New Year's Eve with all of my friends, or unlocking every character in every track in Double Dash with my older brother. Tack on Melee, Wind Waker, Sunshine, The Thousand Year Door, Bratz Forever Diamonds, and so much more, and you have what any kid growing up in the early 2000s would consider a best friend in the form of a little silver box with a handle on it. <laughs> Alright, so that wraps up the year of 2001 into a nice little bite-sized video game burrito. At risk of this review running on too long and being unfoldable like one of those Chipotle behemoths, I decided to cut some games down to the honorable mentions category, a list which includes the likes of Black and White, Silent Hill 2, Eco, Devil May Cry, Golden Sun, Pikmin, The Simpsons Road Rage, and GTA 3. Overall, I want to give this year a ranking in the ballpark of an 8 out of 10. There were some timeless classics, some games that pioneered their genres, and most importantly, there were very few flops. If I had to rate my top three games of the year, it should come as no surprise, but the rankings would look something like Conquer at third, Pokemon Crystal at second, and Jack and Daxter at one. This year was huge for me, and those games have all stood the test of time in my personal preferences. All right, that wraps up 2001 nicely into what I hope is a burrito that doesn't require a fork and knife, because at that point, it's basically just a casserole. And while I don't necessarily mind casseroles, it's kind of an entirely different beast that calls for a separate kind of occasion. Like, you're not gonna go pick up a Chipotle casserole and take it on a picnic or like, I don't know, if you're in a hurry, but you want to enjoy some. Seriously though, you guys, if you stuck around this long, I would love to hear your thoughts on this year as a whole. And if you liked the video, I would really appreciate a like and your continued presence in the community. Finally, Let's end this year off with one final laugh as friends on the waterfront before the impending doom of 2020 swallows our existence and leaves us on a deserted island where the only games available are The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, Tipped and Caper, and Bratz Forever Diamonds. On second thought, that actually, <laughs> that doesn't sound too bad. shouldn't laugh anymore.